Open up your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us online as well. There was a story about a young man who was about to enter Bible college, and he was just about to head into that era of his life, and he began to get really anxious as he began to think about the conversations he was going to be thrust into, and he was really concerned that he was just going to get caught up in this like debating cycle between like, you know, the historical reliability of the Bible and pre-awe and post-millennialism and what do I do with the historicity of this and how do I debate that? And there was just like Calvin, Arminian, all these things. And so he was getting all twisted up on the inside before he was leaving for Bible college. So he decided to seek out a pastor in the area where he grew up. And he said, I want to talk to this pastor and kind of just lay out the stuff I'm wrestling with. And he was surprised at the pastor's response. Here's what the pastor said to him, quote, young man, don't waste your time debating these things. Go to your room and meet God. The goal of life is not sharing of opinions, but the beauty of encounter, end quote. And that young man's pastor, A.W. Tozer, pretty good person to seek out some words of counsel before Bible college, right? It was Tozer who said the following, I put this quote in your notes, I want the presence of God himself or I don't want anything at all to do with religion. I want all that God has or I don't want any. You see, we're living at a time where it seems like increasingly so people's value is tied to the opinions that they hold. I mean, we debate and have opinions about all kinds of things these days, right? We're debating politics and sports and religion and sexuality and economics and even like our latest HOA covenants and HOA drama. I mean, we just debate everything. But here, I think Tozer's words, right, very poignant. If we're not careful, we could find ourselves overflowing with opinion, but empty toward God. And that holds true for the subject we find ourselves coming to this morning in Ephesians 5. It's the subject of marriage, a topic that creates a lot of a debate and a lot of opinion and a lot of discussion and, yes, a lot of emotion around the topic. And we've come to this section in Ephesians 5 in the context of a whole letter we've been walking through. Right, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, and now Paul begins to dress. He takes a turn in your Bibles. In, in chapter 5, Ted a few weeks ago hit, be imitators of God, therefore. That's the opening verse of Ephesians 5. Be imitators of God, therefore. And you may remember the backdrop of Ephesians is you can understand the book of Ephesians this way. Ephesians 1 to 3 is the calling you've received in Jesus. Ephesians 4 to 6 is the living in light of the calling. So in light of the calling you've been given, Ephesians 1 to 3, live accordingly, Ephesians 4 to 6. So he comes to chapter 5 and he says, be imitators of God, therefore, and in your Bibles, you may, you may see in your headers, if you have an NIV or even those Bibles that put little headings, you'll see husbands and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters, chapter 5 and 6, husbands and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters. So here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, here's how you imitate God in your marriage your parenting, and your work. That's the context of the second part in chapter 5 and into chapter 6. Statistics say that about 70% of Americans at some point in their life will walk the aisle and get married. And maybe some of you are here and you're single. My hope and prayer is that you would Take this morning's message, and it would help you create a bit of a framework for your understanding of what marriage is about. Recently, I was in a conversation with a, a friend who told me about a fellow pastor. We had a mutual acquaintance who was a, a pastor, and, and this person said, hey, um, this pastor's kind of listened to some messages that I've given over the years and is familiar with the premarital counseling I offer couples, and the comment was, yeah, I think Pastor Eric's teaching on marriage is outdated and needs to be brought up to the times. I thought about that a little bit. Um, I thought, man, if the accusation is that the teaching is outdated and it's tied to what I've sought for, I've sought to only represent what God has to say about marriage. And that 
My understanding is since God created marriage, then he knows best how it works, that we want to look to him and his principles and his guidance and his direction for what he says marriage is. So if the accusation is that uh, what I'm saying is outdated, and if that's tied to, well, it's just anchored in the scriptures, then I'll take it as a compliment. I'll take it as a compliment, you know. And I don't think God left it into the hands of humans to edit and update what I believe is a received reality, a vision of how God said the marriage covenant should work. So if you're here and you're single, my prayer is like everybody's going to have a grid by which they navigate relational decisions in their life. I just want to offer you today the grid of since God created marriage, I would hope you might look to the creator of it and say, how did he say this thing should work? Or maybe you're here and you're divorced and you've gone through a really tough stretch that way. My prayer is this morning would be So maybe some healing, maybe some perspective about what you went through and what began to unravel and and also maybe a grid for any future relational decisions you may make. Or maybe this morning finds you in a really hard place in your marriage. And my prayer for you is that today you would find hope and you would find companionship that Jesus is with you in the deepest valleys and the darkest days. One thing will doesn't take long to learn about marriage is God promised to be with us. He never promised it would be easy, but he did promise it would be worthwhile if we would stay faithful and stay at it with him. And so as we step into this, I want us to approach what I believe is one of the anchor texts on marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. There's a handful of them in the Bible, and Ephesians 5 being one of them. It's like one of the real anchors when it comes to understanding, like, what is the marriage covenant? How did God say these dynamics should work? What about roles? And, and Paul presses into this. This isn't some, like, random sermon on marriage that Paul gives the church at Ephesus. This is in the flow of unfolding how the flag of the gospel got planted in a group of people in a modern-day city called Ephesus that we said it's where Vegas meets Miami. Remember Ephesus? It was a crazy city that had a lot of very anti-Jesus. It was was so antithetical to the gospel. So when the flag of the gospel gets planted in this group of people, it's going to affect not just some things, but it's going to affect everything. And so Paul is unfolding now the application for how the movement of Jesus begins to impact a relationship that almost everyone in that culture would have entered into at that time, which is they would have entered into a covenant called marriage. And Paul's going to introduce introduce them to an understanding about it that would be quite different than anything they've ever encountered. So here's how we're going to navigate it today. I want you to think about a summary of this section from 21 to 33 in your Bibles. Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. If I had to put a header over it, I'd say this. A gospel-centered marriage lives from a place of mutual submission. A gospel-centered marriage lives from a place of mutual submission. So we're going to look at what does spirit-filled submission look like for the husband? What does spirit-filled submission look like for the wife? And then what does it look like when two people come together and commit to this kind of a union, what does that communicate to a world that is desperately confused about what love is? So we're going to look at these three things. And so the framework for the whole section is what George and Alyssa read for us in verse 21. You imitate God in your marriage. Verse 20, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the framework for imitating God in your marriage. It's mutual submission. Everything else Paul says from 22 to 33 comes under that heading, under that banner. From this place of mutual submission, you move towards one another. Now, it's difficult to put into words how radically reorienting that statement would be to the first century Mediterranean world. Like, to say that first century Mediterranean, Greek, Roman, and Jewish culture, to say that it was a patriarchal society would be an understatement. It was extremely patriarchal. Women were viewed as inferior to men as a baseline. For example, Aristotle wrote that the reason women weren't in positions of leadership had to do with their lack of mental capacity and their deficiency of character to handle it. In the Jewish world, often men would be caught saying a prayer, Lord, thank you that you did not make me a woman. Picture how that would go over. It'd be a little difficult group prayer time. That's probably where they had gender-specific prayer groups. 
And women, they didn't have any standing under the law. They couldn't be witnesses in court. This is in the Jewish world. She was her husband's possession exclusively. Now, in Greek culture, it was even more extreme. The Greek men were expect, had expected that their wife would run the home, care for the children, while he would be off working and kind of indulging in his pleasures the way he want, want to indulge them, mainly with prostitutes. So the concept of fidelity in the Greek home, in the Greek culture, was virtually unheard of. Female babies were abandoned in Greek culture more frequently than the boys were, and Greek men would often marry girls who were significantly younger. There was a massive age gap in the Greek culture. Older Greek men bearing, bearing very young Greek women, you would probably call them teenage girls, that were forced into these marriages, and husbands ruled into the public sphere, women were relegated to the home. So here's the context. This is the baseline assumption of Jewish, Greek, and Roman culture is that women were not equal to men. Paul understands this and is writing now into this setting, and he's unfolding what it means to plant the flag of the gospel in the center of that cultural context. Can you feel the tension around the collision of worldviews that's coming up here? That's what's happening. There's a collision of a gospel-centered, Jesus has made me alive in Christ, mutual submission colliding with a Greco-Roman household value that was upheld for centuries prior. That's the collision happening here in Ephesians 5. That would be in the category of, Paul, we've never heard anything like this. We don't even have a frame of reference for what you're saying of mutual submission, so I want you to think about the second half of Ephesians is like a worldview reformation section, 4, 5, and 6. It's getting really practical of how Paul is saying, with the power of the gospel planted in the heart, there's going to be a reshaping of how you've understood husband and wife relationship to work, how you've understood parenting, how you've understood work, all the things, parenting, marriage, economics, sexuality, work. Jesus has something to say about all of it, and sometimes we can relegate it to like sin, salvation, heaven, and hell. We're like, yeah, he has a lot to say about that. Yes, he does, but he also has a lot to say about how marriage should work, how parenting should work, how finances work, how you should handle your sexuality, all these things. Jesus has something to say about it all, and Paul is unfolding this to the local church in Ephesus, and he starts with a concept that would have to create a lot of elbows in the rib cage. You know, that's what happens when you preach on marriage, there's a lot of, right? So elbow in the rib cage moment when the wives in the gathering hear a statement like submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Poof. So mutual submission is the framework to understand a gospel-centered marriage. So what does spirit-filled submission look like for the husband? You understand now why Paul starts with husbands. If that's the cultural context, you're going to start with the husband. And so here's what it looks like. Three things uh, from the text that George and Alyssa read, starting in verse 25. Sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and satisfying love. Look at sacrificial love, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So Paul reaches for a metaphor to try to attach for these young believers in Ephesus to say, hey, I want you to begin to rethink how you relate to one another. And so he reaches for a metaphor that they're beginning to understand, like Jesus and the church Husbands, wives. That's what he reaches and applies. And he says, husbands, I'd like you to think about Christ's love for his bride, the church. And I'd like you now to manifest that love towards your wife. And notice he particularly draws attention to gave himself up for her. There's a selflessness to Christ's love, right? The sacrificial love involves a, a selflessness, like Jesus laid down his life for his bride. Husbands were to lay down our lives in a selfless and sacrificial way toward our spouse. And then unconditional. I want you to think about Christ's love as unconditional. That no matter how Jesus' bride was responding to him, his love was unconditional. It wasn't tethered to how people were or were not responding. And so Paul says, hey, husbands, unconditional. That needs to be your posture towards your wife. And then relentless. I want you to think about re relentlessness to Jesus' love, how he never gives up on us. I mean, we're all here as a testimony to that, that he just keeps pursuing us, that he believes there's more, that he just keeps coming after us, 
that there's no pit so deep that his love and grace aren't deeper still. He just pursues. He keeps coming for us. He never gives up on us. So I want you to see this grid, right? There's this selflessness. There's an unconditional. There's a relentless pursuit. And Paul says, husbands, a Christian marriage is a call to this kind of sacrificial, selfless, unconditional, relentless pursuit of your wife the way Jesus pursues his bride, the church. And to play Pastor Obvious for a minute, that is not natural for a man. That is not a natural inclination to come out of a man's heart. A man is naturally like egotistical, prideful, arrogant, and incredibly good at whining when we're sick. That's like what comes out of the heart of a man. Like for a man to get to a place where they move to think about their wife's needs ahead of their own, that takes a massive movement of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a man to begin to move to a place where they set their agenda aside for the sake of another. Do you see this? Like this is a picture of how uh, the flag of the gospel has to get planted in the heart of a man for there to be any manifestation of sacrificial love to the degree that Paul is outlining here. So here's a picture of June 6, 1992, coming up on 31 years. Oh, how you doing, Kendra Ray Simpson, right there, huh? She looks amazing. Some of you are like, Pastor Eric, what the heck is on top of your head right there? Some of you had no idea that there was a day when I held that. Almost 31 years ago. We were in love and completely clueless. I was 23, she was 22. We had no idea what we were doing when we were walking that aisle. I had no idea how breathlessly selfish I was until I walked that aisle. You know, marriage is like a tree that's planted right in the center of your house. You've been in those restaurants, there's a giant tree in the center of the restaurant. They built the whole restaurant around that tree. That's marriage. It's this giant tree grows up in the middle of your house. You can't go anywhere in your house without accounting for the tree. I had no idea. Two decisions I've made in my life that have driven a dagger in the heart of self more than anything else, getting married and having kids. It's like God, he fashioned the family unit together in such a way that brings like Jesus gospel-centered fruit like pressed in upon you. Like it's a big deal that we grow in selflessness and others-oriented and patience and grace and long-suffering and all that. Like those are big deal that God wants us to become those kind of people. And so I could just picture Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sitting around and going, I've got a great idea. I'm going to call them to get married and to build a family. And in that crucible of that minivan, when you're driving down I-75 to Florida, and you're saying, man, there's just a lot of things that get forged in you right there. Come on now. Because see, at the heart of the relationship, God calls the covenant of marriage to be. If you want to have a great marriage, you cannot be selfish and have a great marriage. There's a bunch of people married that are incredibly self-centered and just all about their needs and their wants and their marriage isn't going to be great. You can be a parent and be completely centered on yourself and your needs. You just can't be a great parent. You can't experience the kind of marriage and family unit that God has in mind when he called this together unless there's a degree. The flag of the gospel gets planted and the work of the spirit in your heart moves to this Jesus posture which says, I'm going to lay down my life for the sake of others. And that's why the family unit becomes like a daily, sometimes hourly invitation to lay yourself down. What Christ did, right? He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. And so Paul presents a vision to a group of husbands who had no context. I mean, they didn't have a frame of reference for what he's unfolding. You're saying, Paul, you mean like job number one, like if I've got my role as a husband is to move toward my wife with a level of selflessness and unconditional and relentless pursuit in this posture of a sacrificial love to consider her needs above mine? Yes. 
And I think you can see the connection that's only possible when the gospel gets planted in the heart. And the work of the Spirit begins to kind of unlearn the ways of the Greco-Roman household code and begin to adopt the ways of a gospel-centered, Jesus has made me alive in him type household code. So this is sacrificial love. Here's the first picture. We're talking about what does spirit-filled submission for the husband look like. The first principle is a sacrificial love. Combine that with a sanctifying love. Did you see this in verse 26 and 27? He says, husbands, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So husbands, follow this. When a woman says yes to marrying an Ephesians 5 man, she should reach her redemptive potential because of that yes, not in spite of it. I'm going to say that again because I think this went right over a bunch of you guys. When a woman says yes to walking the aisle with an Ephesians 5 man, she should reach her redemptive potential because of that yes, not in spite of it. The posture for the husband isn't, I'm going to get married, and how can this person help me fulfill everything God wants me to do in my life? That's not the posture of an Ephesians 5 marriage and a gospel-centered covenant. The posture is, how can I give myself away to my wife in such a way that she flourishes in all that God has called her to be and do for his glory? So you see, like, that means husbands, like, we have to be the ones taking the initiative to understand our wife's dreams and visions and aspirations and to celebrate her and to get behind her and to help her embrace all that God wants to call her into. Can you see how radically reorienting this would be for this group of, like, young Christians sitting in Ephesus, for the husbands to begin to get a hold of this kind of a vision? This way, nobody talked like this until the people of Jesus walked into Ephesus. Nobody. But now the people of Jesus are in Ephesus, and they're talking about things like mutual submission and sacrificial love and sanctifying love and considering, like, the wife flourishing and becoming her full measure in Christ because of her union with her husband. John Tyson put it this way. I put this quote in your notes. The strength of my godliness wasn't revealed in how much I did for God, but in whether or not my wife was reaching her redemptive potential because she was married to me. That's it. That's the sanctifying love. So for the Simpson house, we're like five months away, five months from empty nest. Can you believe that? Some of you remember when we like brought Lily out here and Kaylin out here and dedicated them. Do you guys remember that? So we've been around a long, I mean, we just dedicated them. And then they grew up in children's ministry and student ministry. And it's like, the, it's like the lyrics from Need to Breathe and the years go by like stones under rushing water. That wasn't helpful, was it? <laughs> it's okay. But they just go by. Where did the years go? And now we're staring at empty nest. Five months. And so as a husband, Kendra and I have been having conversations about like dreaming and praying about the next chapter specifically for her life. She spent the last 20 plus years primarily just pouring herself in and investing at home and caring for our girls and helping them grow up as two amazing young ladies. I mean, she's an amazing wife, an amazing mother. And if you see the beauty and the radiance on Kaylin and Lily's life, it's because she just gave herself away for the last 20 plus years, a beautiful gift. Man, that's a big change. Some of you ladies in this room know the significance of the change for her that's coming. So I begin, we begin talking about it. I've been praying for her for several months just about what are the, what's the next chapter going to be for Kendra? God, what are you birthing? What are the dreams you have for her? How can she flourish into this emptiness season of her life? That's my role as a husband to help her to be able, because she's married to me, that she'd step into this next chapter and to hold on to whatever God wants her to embrace. But I'm a part of that. I don't just kind of sit idly in the background. And no, I'm I'm praying for her. I want to have conversations. I want to do what I can to help her step into whatever it is God has called her to step into. Are you tracking with me? It's a satisfying love this way. Do you see this? There's a sacrificial love. There's a sanctifying love. And then there's this third element of a satisfying love. Look at verse 28. In the same way, 
Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. Some of your translations have, in verse 29, feeds and cares, it translates nourish and cherish. You see that? So Ephesians 5 man understands this, that we're not to be an emotional brute in our household. We're to learn to nourish and cherish our wife the way Jesus does his bride, the church. That Christ died for the church. Christ provides for the church. Christ protects the church. He helps the church stand firm and steadfast no matter what stands against her. That, Paul says, husbands, there's your vision for being a Christian married man right there. That you move towards your wife with sacrificial and sanctifying and satisfying love. That you speak words of life to her where there's been accusation, that you speak words of hope where there's been despair, that you speak words of encouragement where there's been condescension and judgment, that men, as husbands, we bring our strength into the relationship and we do whatever we have to do to help our wife step in to the full measure of her potential in Christ to flourish, to nourish and cherish her to the point of flourishing in her walk with God and her service for him. That's our role as husbands. That's what spirit-filled submission is to look like. Husbands, are you with me? Say amen. This is what this looked like. Like this is a picture of, remember the banner is, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, verse 21. And now he starts, poignantly so, with the husbands, and he is pressing on the husband, saying, men, you got to unlearn some Greco-Roman cultural stuff here, and you got to embrace the flag of the gospel getting planted in your heart that's going to be centered around sacrificial and sanctifying and satisfying love. And so, well, what about the wives? So, ladies, we're coming to your neighborhood, as the pastors used to say. We're coming to your neighborhood. He comes to the wives, and he says, okay, now, ladies, what does spirit-filled submission look like for the wives? Verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, submit. Submit, that word I put in the Greek says it's hupatasso, and it means to align yourself with. It means to be subject to. It means to be placed under. So the context for Paul's exhortation here, Paul, very grounded in Old Testament theology. I mean, he was... He gives his resume many times in the New Testament about the depth and breadth of his understanding of Old Testament uh, law and language. And so Genesis 1 would have been the full context that he's bringing Ephesians 5 from. And in Genesis 1, God make, Moses makes it clear in Genesis 1 that men and women are made equally in the image of God. Male and female created in the image of God. Imago Dei, that's the Latin. So when a man and a woman is marked with the Imago Dei, that establishes value. Now, here's what happens in our culture today. We merge value and role like this. So we, we, think, we immediately start talking about roles like husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. We're talking about some roles, and we immediately take the role and move it to a place of value. But value is established with Imago Dei, and out of the place of Imago Dei, you establish roles in relationships. That's how humanity works. And so this is how out of the marriage covenant comes from a place of Imago Dei. So Genesis 1, hey, it's clear. Men and women equally valuable. Add that to Proverbs 31. I mean, Proverbs 31, what a beautiful chapter on the intelligence and the vision and the leadership and the productivity of a woman. I mean, the value of a Proverbs 31 woman. I mean, the the kind of leadership she manifests, it's a vision for the value and the way God sees women in this world. Combine that when Jesus comes on the scene. And you know, one of the things Jesus constantly did was he stirred up the cultural norms concerning women. He was the one who was always crossing all these cultural barriers with women. Jesus had a group of women around him who became significant leaders in his movement. I mean, he would look to women to help lead and empower. He would be working with women. He would be doing it in a way that's very intentional. So you put Genesis 1 and Proverbs 31 and the ministry of Jesus, you put that in the context of what Paul's going to say right now. So everything Paul's going to say to women 
about aligning their self with their husband's love, it's going to come under this banner. It's not relegating them to a background role to raise kids and be at home. That is not the application. You cannot draw that connection. There's been a bunch of kind of abuse of the language that way, but the vision is Jesus is coming to radically reorient a culture that mostly oppressed women. Jesus is one who began to set some of those barriers free. He began to move in, and Paul's just capitalizing on that, and he uses a language about a submitting to the husbands as to the Lord. I want you to think, ladies, about your role of submission as a role of alignment. I want you to think about aligning yourself under your husband's love. I want, you to, I want to translate it this way. Let your husband love you well. Let him in there. You've got to let him in your heart that way. That's the significance of this term. Because the wives' submission here, did you track it? Like wives are submitting themselves to a sacrificial, sanctifying, satisfying love. The submission is, ladies, you open your heart to a man who is moving towards you with an Ephesians 5 posture of love, with a Christ-like love. As he moves towards you, ladies, you have to open your heart to that. And it's not easy. I know that. It takes a degree of trust. It involves risk. But I want you to see, ladies, wives, you're not going to experience the marriage that God intends you to experience if you build up walls around your heart and you never let him in. And this is the battle. This is the challenge, which is why I spent the first part of the message painting what I hope is a beautiful picture of a safe and secure, like the safety and security of the environment that Paul paints for the ladies to align themselves with the husband's love. Did you see that? Like, ladies, if, if you meet a man who will lay his life down and consider you ahead of himself, who's moving towards you selflessly, who's manifesting unconditional love, who's relentlessly pursuing you, who's sanctifying and satisfying and sacrificing for you, in that setting, who has this vision to see you flourish, who wants to nourish and cherish you, it's in that environment, ladies, do you see? That's the environment that... Sh- you're called to open your heart to and align yourself with. And ladies, if you'll let me, I'm going to press here a little bit. I'm going to say it candidly. Ladies, if he's not Ephesians 5, he doesn't deserve your heart. If he's not Ephesians 5, next. He doesn't deserve your heart. And I suspect much of the heartache and heartbreak and pain you carry, some of you ladies in your relational history, I suspect it has to do with you aligned your heart and you let a man in there who was far less than Ephesians 5. He was egotistical, he was self-centered, he was narcissistic, he just, and you just, I don't, lady, you just, you just like the way he looked, I don't know, you like the commas and zeros in his paycheck, maybe you were convinced if you just stayed with him, you could change him, but the principle here, ladies, I want you to see this, if he's not Ephesians 5, he doesn't deserve your heart. And here's what I think, because, you know, for the last 28 years, I've been trying to help a lot of couples and a lot of relational stuff. And I think this, I think if we had more women with a level of devotion to not settle for less than God's best, if we had more women refusing to settle for less than Ephesians 5, I think we'd have more men moving towards sacrificial, sanctifying, satisfying love. That's what I think. Because candidly, sometimes it's too easy for some of the men to stay self-centered and egotistical and prideful and just be an emotional brute because I think we've got a breakdown where some ladies are letting some men in to the heart that have no business being there. 
And so this is why the vision is first painted towards a husband's spirit-filled submission and then a wife's alignment and allowing this kind of a man into her heart who is manifesting Ephesians 5 type of qualities, a sacrificial, sanctifying, satisfying love. So two words, ladies, for your spirit-filled submission. Alignment, and then stay with me, respect. Verse 33, do you see the respect issue? Verse 33 says, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must, what's it say? Respect her husband. Say, what's this related to? It's like, when a man gets a vision for this, when a man gets a vision for sacrificing and selflessly laying down himself and moving towards his wife and help nourish and cherish her, when a man moves towards his wife with this kind of a love, it's going to be awkward. It's just going to be awkward. Like, it just is. From vision to execution, there's going to be a great disparity between intent and product. Are you with me? I guarantee the ladies are with me, guys. Like, this is how this works. So, so, and here's the tendency. Wives, in this place of awkwardness, as we as men try to figure this out and move towards a woman with this kind of love, it's just going to be awkward. We're just going to be a little out of sorts. And ladies, your tendency is to offer critique and commentary in the awkwardness. You're really good at it. <laughs> Things like, oh, that's date night? What's up with that? That's the best you got? There's so many layers inside of a man that have to get worked through. The insecurities, the comparisons, the fear of failure, the pride. Like when we start trying to lay ourselves down and move towards a woman in this way, like there's just a lot going on inside of a man's heart. And so wise, here's what I want to encourage you to do. When your husband is taking steps towards you in the stream of Ephesians 5, I want you to celebrate that. I want you to respect that. I want you to encourage that. I want you to say something like, Dating game, strong, strong. That was great. What else you got? Like, celebrate it. You get behind him, say, That's, we're moving towards this because there's this vision of God's planted a gospel in the heart of a Christian man, and he wants to move towards a woman. Here's what the movement is supposed to be, sacrificial and sanctifying and satisfying love. And it will be awkward. It's just going to be awkward. And so, ladies, we're going to have to need, you're going to need some self-control in critique and commentary and condescension that can come when a man is trying to move towards you in that place of awkwardness. How are we doing, ladies? If you're with me, say amen. And so, do you see, church, do you see this? A man comes alive on the inside when a woman begins to respect and affirm and encourage, even if his steps are awkward, at least he's moving in the right direction to encourage that. And men, that's why we need one another to spur one another on this way. And ladies, this is how you can pray for your husbands in this way. It's just not easy, but it's possible with the help of Christ spirit in us. And equally so, there's something inside of a man that kind of shrivels up and shrinks back when every time he tries to take a step forward, he's met with a three-point critique on the step forward. That's the, that doesn't help. And so it's this combination, right, of a man moving towards a wife in spirit-filled submission and a wife moving and aligning herself placing herself under her husband's love and with great respect and encouragement, the steps he's taking towards Ephesians 5 with you. That's the environment of what it means to a gospel-centered marriage grows out of the soil of mutual submission. So worship team, why don't you come on back up? Here's how I'm going to kind of bring this to a close today and invite us to the communion table. Paul makes, if this wasn't enough, could you imagine like the first time this letter was read? Can you just picture the there had to be many gasps, and there had to be, wait, 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 when the elder probably standing up reading it, probably saying, hey, wait, 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 could you say that again? Like, hey, wait, 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 we love Paul. We know he kind of laid his life down for us. We respect Paul. We know he's got our best in mind. But we're, 
say that again. What did you mean by that? There's a lot of that going on. The first time this kind of a vision for marriage is unfolded for this group in Ephesus. And then he comes to verse 32. This is why he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Wow. Would you agree with me? There's a profound mystery here in God's vision for marriage about how he said men and women should work together. Just when you think you've got it figured out, I promise you there's going to be more to learn. Chat with anyone who's been married for any length of time. There's a profound mystery to how God says this should be together. And he ties it to this beautiful picture of, can you see this church? Could it be that one of the greatest gifts our local church could give our world today, could it be that we could give them the gift of Ephesians 5 marriages? Certainly not perfectly, but just... Men committed to be an Ephesians 5 man, women committed to be an Ephesians 5 woman, and marriages committed to be Ephesians 5, and we just stay at it, leaning in Christ with the help of His Spirit, and we just stay at it, and stay at it, and we keep serving, and helping, and mutual submission, giving ourselves to way, that the watching world, who's super confused about what love is, it's like a megaphone to the world that says, you want to know what love's like? Look at that. I know that the world says you can have all kinds of this and anything compared to that. You get a hold of that kind of a vision for love, that's better than anything this world is going to paint for you. And I think we've got a generation of young people that need a vision, and we've got to own that as a generation growing up before them. Could it be this is the megaphone that we give them? A megaphone of what? A profound mystery of Ephesians 5 men married to Ephesians 5 women building an Ephesians 5 marriage and that people would see that, the glory of God's great gospel, that God would so love the world this way that he would send Jesus for us. And it's manifested how? In that relationship right there. See, marriage is like this megaphone of the glory and the beauty of the gospel of God's great love for us manifested in a human relationship. And what a gift that could be to our world today that's super confused. And let me say this. This is why in the church world, when people say, why is the church world so wound up about what the true definition of marriage? This is why. This is how much hangs in the balance, church. Because God said, when you look at the covenant of marriage, it's to mirror and reflect his great love for his bride, the church. So when you distort that, do you see? Christians are in uproar, rightly so, because we're defending, right, what God says, this is how covenant love should look. And he didn't leave it into the hands of the people to edit and update as we see fit. We receive this vision and we live accordingly from it. And so this morning, we're going to go to the communion tables here. We've got the tables set up. Many of you have been around Eagle for a long time. We've got them back in their normal places, kind of post-COVID, hallelujah. We can get back up, and we're going to walk, and we're going to go around the tables, and they're already the prepackaged one. It's not the tear and dip of the old days. It's still the prepackaged. But nonetheless, here's the opportunity we have. I want you in just a moment to pray for us. We're going to get up. I'd love for you to go as a family unit, go with your spouse. If you're here as a single person, They go with a friend, or if you want to spend some time alone, right? Prayer benches are here. I know this subject brings up a ton of emotional history for many of you, and some of you come in from really difficult spaces from this. You've longed for Ephesians 5, and perhaps you've experienced far less than that, and you're carrying a lot with that. You come to the table today, and you come to these prayer benches, and if you need prayer, there'll be folks here to pray with you and for you. And then moms and dads, husbands and wives, what a great opportunity to re-up our own personal commitment to one another as we hold these elements to re-establish our own personal commitment. Husbands, this is a time, right, when we internalize Christ's love right here. We internalize his body, his blood inside. Hey, we need this manifested in our homes. And wives, equally so. We need this manifested in our homes. Christ in us, Christ through us, Christ for us. And so the invitation to the table is set for you. And our communion table is open to anyone. You don't have to be a member here, but you do have to be a part of the family of Jesus. You have to, the table is set for those who've said yes to Jesus. So if you want to say yes to Jesus in just a moment, you come and take communion for the first time. Praise God, you're welcome to do that. Or you can just remain seated and have some time just to reflect on. The team's going to lead us through a song. This is our personal space. And so the table is set, so you you don't have to form one line to go to these tables. There's going to be places all around the edges of the table. 
for you to go. So just kind of all around the table, grab, spread out all around this room in groups. If you want to pray together, be by yourself, come to the prayer benches. This is our time. Let's stand together. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Paul's willing obedience to write down words that are so formative and have created such a vision for marriage that could only be from the Lord. (laughs) Only God, that's what we say, only God could come up with such an amazing relationship called the family unit. And God, we just bring our we bring our brokenness, our sadness to this table. We, we bring the things that just are unsettled and unfinished and unresolved. We bring it to this table. We take in your broken body and shed blood. We worship you as we do this. And I pray for a mighty outpouring of your spirit on the marriages of this church. Raise up a generation of Ephesians 5 marriages to proclaim the greatness of gospel love to this world. I ask it for Jesus' sake.